Hey everybody, Adam here. Hope everyone is doing well. I got a new jacket. Recently joined a biker gang, just for the fun of it, but mostly for protection. That's beside the point. You know, I'm normally so loquacious when I record these videos, but today, in fact, I think I'm feeling rather laconic. So, I'm gonna skip over the usual prattling and crack on. All right, so here is where I'm at thus far. Might as well take a walk around the building so you can see what everything looks like. As you can see we got some uh, windows installed. I'm going to talk about those in a separate video. That's another topic. I don't want to try to squeeze too much into this video. And the first thing I'm going to be talking about is air sealing. Now, it's been said that when you air seal, you're killing two birds with one stone because you're also bug sealing. Because if air can't flow through a space, then bugs can't crawl through it. Makes sense. But I'm also going to take it two steps further and say that you're killing four birds with one stone because you're not just air sealing and bug sealing, but you're also water sealing. Because if you've got a solid air barrier and air can't pass through it, then bulk water won't be able to leak through it. And you're also sound dampening. Sound travels best through open air. So if you've got a lot of air leaks in your building, then you're not gonna have a quiet home. You're gonna hear noise from the outside and vice versa. So if that's something you care about, which I do, you really want to seal it up like a drum. So the first air sealing detail starts down here, at the bottom of the soap plate. I sealed up that edge with Loctite Premium. And it's really important to seal the bottom of the soap plate because air will leak in and out of the building through there. Your sheathing alone won't do enough. Um, and I use Loctite Premium because I've used this stuff in the past. This is not a commercial, I'm not sponsored or anything. I just know that once that stuff dries, it is forever. And um, you might think, well, that stuff's so expensive, I don't want to waste my money on that. I only used one large tube to go around the entire perimeter of the building. So it was only a $14 detail, not a big deal. The next air sealing detail is actually on the inside. Now I'm going to finish this after I finish the rest of the exterior because that's more important right now. But you can see I've got these multi-ply studs everywhere. And some of them have some pretty big gaps between them. Like here I've got maybe like an eighth inch gap. I can actually see some light passing through there. So, and that's because studs are never perfectly straight. They're always a little bent. Um, so yeah, everywhere I find a big gap like that, I'm sealing it up with stretch caulk like I've done right here and stretch caulk specifically so that it's less likely to crack as the wood expands and contracts. Next air sealing detail is the tape. If you don't tape the joints of the plywood or seams, however you prefer to say it, then you pretty much got an air leak. Uh, I'm using black Gorilla Tape. I was gonna use Sega, which seems to be the gold standard for most builders. But it's expensive and it's hard to get. I could only get it online. And that's a problem for me out here because even Amazon Prime packages take about a week to get here. So yeah, I decided to go with the black Gorilla Tape. It's uh, moisture resistant, heat resistant, all weather, indoor, outdoor, and it's permanent tape. So once it's on there, it's not supposed to get peeled back off. It's supposed to be forever. And the reviews were really good. So I figured, yeah, let's give it a shot. Uh, it seemed to be working out just fine. Uh, actually, I actually have to give Taryn credit for doing the taping. She did a fantastic job. And I think the easiest way to do it is to work with small strips, about a foot, foot and a half. Start at the bottom, roll it on with your fingers, then take a roller and roll out all the creases and the bubbles. We actually just used a regular uh, kitchen rolling pin, work to treat. And then once you got your first strip on there, 
overlap it with the next one, like shingles, and so on, until you get to the top. If you try to do one big long strip all at once, the wind blows it, it's going to get away from you, it twists on itself, and then your tape's ruined and you got to cut off another piece. And uh, tape gets expensive when you're using it like this. Um, we've already gone through, I think, three 50-foot rolls. Still have a whole lot more to do once I start doing the ceiling and finish up the rest of these walls. I also might as well right now just go ahead and address this four inch gap up here. So I'm actually extending the height of the walls by another four feet. And then another row of four by eight plywood will go across that, but just horizontally. So that's why that gap is there. Now uh, another detail, now this is, this is kind of a two in one. This blue stuff right here, polyethylene foam, the sill seal. Some of you might remember that from my previous video. And if you haven't seen that video, check it out. There's a lot of information in there. That's uh, the video about the deck. So in that situation, I was using that stuff to form a capillary break between the concrete and the deck joist. But now in this application, I'm using it for two entirely different purposes. Number one, it's to create a thermal break. So you see, between the plywood and every stud, I've got a strip of that foam. And that's, the, that's one of the ways that I'm decoupling the outside from the inside, thermally speaking. It's not a perfect decoupling, but it's better than nothing. And it's gonna slow the conduction of heat from the plywood to the studs and vice versa. So that's the concept there. And I just reminded myself, I'll throw a picture up on the screen so you can see what that detail looks like without the plywood. The other purpose that it's serving is it's another air sealing detail. So when the plywood compresses it against the studs, it forms a gasket. Now I guess I might as well talk about the plywood, the sheathing. So I'm using 5 eighths plywood. So its actual thickness is just a little bit thicker than a true half inch. I think it's 0.578, I, I, I'm probably messing that up. That's something like that. Just a little bit more than a half inch thick. And I'll give you a tip. If you're working by yourself like I am and you haven't worked with thick sheets of plywood before, this stuff is pretty heavy and cumbersome. Each one weighs about 60 pounds. So what I'm probably, well I know I'm gonna do it, is when I get to that second row, I'm actually gonna rip them in half. So then I got 30 pound squares that are a lot easier to manage. Next, I'll talk about weather-resistive barriers, WRBs. So you got three to choose from. You can do mechanically fastened, a house wrap. You can do peel and stick. So that's basically like foil face stickers that you roll onto the sheathing. Or you can do what I've done, which is a fluid applied. I think most builders would agree that fluid applied is the best. Um, the only people that would probably disagree with that are the guys selling house wraps and peeling sticks. There are lots of options out there for fluid applied. Uh, I chose to go with, this is a 100% acrylic weather resistant exterior paint. I'm sorry, I know that's a mouthful. I'm just gonna say acrylic from now on. And acrylic is a plastic not to be confused with latex, which is a natural compound that comes from trees. It's used to make rubber and all sorts of other stuff. So this is really like, I put plastic on the plywood. And what it does is, it, once the acrylic dries, it creates a water barrier. The, the surface of the wood now repels water and I actually brought a spray bottle here so I can show you how this works. So when wind-driven rain gets pushed through my cladding, it's gonna first have to go through an eighth inch gap. That's one and a half inches wide. Then it's gonna have to go through another one and a half inches of open airspace. So when it hits the sheathing, I think it's gonna be something more like a mist or little droplets. So it'll probably look something like this. Well, this isn't working out well at all. Let me adjust this little nozzle in here. Yeah, 
hopefully that's good enough to give you an idea. See, it just beads up and then it starts to roll down. And that's the concept there. Instead of, this was just bare plywood, would sort of stick to the plywood and gradually start to soak into it. And one of the reasons I went with a fluid applied instead of a house wrap or peel and stick is because I only need the water control layer. Uh, the plywood itself is an air barrier, as long as the joints are taped. And the plywood itself is also a vapor retarder. It's a class three vapor retarder. And I should mention, even though this, this, this acrylic is technically a plastic, it's not a vapor barrier like a solid sheet of plastic. It's also somewhere probably in the class three range. And maybe the combination of the two pushes it into the class two, but that's still vapor open enough compared to a true vapor barrier, which would be in the class one range. And when it comes to uh, vapor barriers, the rule of thumb is simple. If you live in a climate that is predictably hot and humid, you're gonna put the vapor barrier on the outside of your wall assembly, so the exterior facing side. If you're in a climate that's predictably cold, you're gonna put it on the interior facing side, so it would go right on the back side of the studs. If you're in a mixed climate like me, then you just don't use one. You're better off without it. Because there's no, as the seasons change, there's no right side of the assembly to have it on. And in fact, in my climate, like this time of year, for example, just yesterday, it was about 78 degrees in the, in the late afternoon. But then this morning, right before the sun came up, it was 29 degrees. So that's like shifting from summer to winter in 12 hours. And that, it's that change in temperature that changes the direction that the vapor diffuses, whether it's diffusing from the outside to the inside or the inside to the outside. So again, you just don't use one. And I'm trying to think, I always do this, I always forget something. Is there anything else? Let's take one more walk around the building. And think about what I am probably getting. Oh, a little building science tip. Another reason that air sealing is so important is because an air leak can actually bring more water into your assembly than vapor diffusion. Air, or, excuse me, moisture traveling on air, humidity, is totally different than molecular diffusion. So if you've got, this is why you have to do a very good job, if you've got an otherwise pretty tight assembly, but then somewhere you got a hole, wall or wherever, and the air can leak in there, that can carry a lot of moisture. So it'll bring that humidity in through that leak, and then it'll condense within the assembly, and then you have problems. And it also reminded me of one other thing, just another little tip, if anybody cares. So sometimes you might miss a stud, it happens. Yeah, just pop some glue in there, and then you're good to go. So yeah, I think that covers it for this video. And I will be back pretty soon with a video talking about the windows.